In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, we ask your, your choicest, richest blessings upon us. And we ask right now that we come to understand these sacred texts. This is the mind of God. This is who you are. This is how we can think your thoughts and be converted to go and to live in the power of the supernatural. Raise us up to the level you called us to be your sons and daughters. Your sons and daughters are reborn because of you and your, your, your life and your, your witness to us. Lord Jesus, save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whose peace is today? St. Margaret Clitheroe. She protected priests in, in England. They caught her, and they killed her. And they, they put a board on her, and then they piled it rock so she died. They did nice things to you back then, huh? They still St. Margaret Clitheroe. Love one another. And they all believe in the same book called the Bible. Now, yes, sir? Is she considered one of the 40 English martyrs? Yes. No, she was definitely an English martyr. All right, now, look at verse 31. Here comes something very interesting that Jesus says. Shimeon, Shimeon. Everybody say Shimeon, Shimeon. Now Jesus calls Peter here his original name. What was St. Peter's father's name? You don't know these things? John. John, very good. One time Jesus in Matthew 16 called him Bar Jonah. Bar doesn't mean a bar that he went to at night. Bar means an Aramaic son of. And he acted like a Jonah because he was wishy-washy and running and running away. So Jesus called him Bar Jonah. But his real father's name was John. What town did they come from? Bethsaida. Do you remember being there? We took you to good stuff. Does Frank remember being there? Yes, Father. Right, did you see the little road Jesus did his miracles on? Boy, that was good. So now, everybody underline the double vocative. Everybody say double vocative. A double vocative means you get your name called twice. How many ever got in trouble by your parents? Never? And the Lord said twice, Philip, Philip. How many ever got their name called twice? By, did, what, what happens if got, your name got called twice? Now, here's a double vocative. On, on the mountain in Exodus 3, Moses gets the double vocative. Moshe. Moshe. Jesus calls Mary, Mary. Now, this is a solemn pronouncement. So when you get your name twice, so start calling your kids twice. And you, madam, get your, get your hand going. They like their hand. The power of the hand. When you start calling your kids, throw a little extra name there, amen? And they'll know something's up with you. That's it, there you got it. So we have Shimeon, Shimeon. So now he goes all the way back to what? His original name. Then he says there something very, very interesting. He says to us there, um, verse 30. He says to us, 31. Satan demanded to have you. Now, when did Satan demand to have him? This is a Job-like experience. In Job chapter 1, Satan knew how to get into heaven. After Satan got thrown out, guess what? This is going to blow your mind. He got back in. That's what I thought you would say. They need a wall. A billion dollars from the Pentagon and put up a wall in heaven. That's a good one. All right, so he got kicked out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 8 to 10. And then all of a sudden he got back in because read Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. He's in the council of the the sons of God. Psalm 82, John chapter 10. Jesus says, you will be like the council of those sons of God. And guess who snuck in? Job. He says, look at those people down in Matawan. 
They're so gay because you're protecting them. Let me at them. Because he wanted them to say, curse God and die. So how would you like to have a, a Mrs. Job? Mrs. Hostility. Her name was I-Y-O-B. E-Y-O-B. Not B-Y-O-B. I-Y-O-B. Which means in Hebrew, hostility. So Satan got back in. Job 1, Job 2. And he said, let me, let me at them. And then they will turn away from you. Let me put them under the test. Now, this is Satan asking to test us. How many feel like you've been through a ringer before? So now here comes Satan's ringer on Shimeon, Shimeon, the reed. R-E-E-D, R-E-E-D, reed man. Everybody remember the reed blowing? And usually where do you find reeds? Around the water. By water. So when we have the rivers of the Holy Spirit, one of them is water. And so here comes Jesus, and here comes Shimeon, Shimeon. Satan wants to sift you. Now, let's give you the image of the sifting. What do you do with sifting? How many have ever seen one of those big shaking? You ever seen them? You put the grain on your Do you remember what do you call that thing with the flour in it? The sifter. Do you still, do you still use those things? Yes. Uh, oh, you do because you're into veggies. And they go, did, did you ever go like... You never did that? You know, some of these things have a lot of musical instruments to it. We should have, we should have a group of all of you ladies, or, or, or some brothers cook. We should call you the, the kitchen, the kitcheners. Amen? <laughs> so now, the sifting was like this. And then, let's see that the grain would fall down. So now you're being sifted. Turn to the person next to you, you're being sifted. Because when you go home later on, how many know the sifting is going to come on? Say the dog is sitting on your pillow. How many know the sifting comes on? Amen? Say your three interesting kids just cause you to do this. Say Primo didn't get the, the right sausage out. You just go like, he's in trouble. How many know you're going to be sifted? Yeah. Amen? Say your husband drives the car home and he doesn't look happy. <laughs> it's called sifting moments. <laughs> Amen? So you're going to be sifted. Now, underline that with me, verse 31. Like wheat. Now, underline wheat. What's the wheat for? The bread. Now, when you have the bread of Passover, it's called what kind of bread? Barley. When you have the... Pe when you have the when you have the fruit of Pentecost, it's called wheat. What are we nearing here? We're nearing Passover, so it should be barley bread. But what does Jesus say? You're the wheat. What is, what is the wheat? The wheat is what you experience at Pentecost. And how many know on Pentecost is a very bread, bready day? And what book do the Jews read even today on Pentecost? The book of Ruth. What's in the book of Ruth? Bread, Bethlehem. What was going on in Bethlehem, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 and 2? A famine. And so Satan was sifting. Let me tell you something about it the rest of your life. You're going to be sifted. That's why I'm going with Maximus the Confessor. I'm going in a cave. But I, I hate noise. I figure my first night in the cave, I'll hear bat wings going on or something. No snakes. No, I can't handle that. <laughs> Next he says there, that he might sift you, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now, how many know, now this is a shock too. Anybody got shocked already? Anybody learned something new already? Satan goes back into heaven, huh? You're the only one in your block that knows that. Second thing is this, you're shock number two. Jesus prays for you. How many here ever asked Jesus to intercede for you? Now you're thinking of all the angels and the saints. You know, when you really get desperate and you look at the interesting crew that you live with, you say, look, I tried all you other saints. I'm giving you a day off. I'm going right to Jesus right now. Amen. A lot of times I say, you need Jesus, honey. Um, and one guy says to me, you know, Father Bill, I said, well, St. Jude never failed me. I said, I'm looking at your life. Skip St. Jude for today and hit Jesus. All right, now. In Hebrews chapter 7, 
Jesus lives forever to make intercession for you. How many are availing yourself of his intercession for you? Now, you got to get this. I'm giving you good stuff. Amen? He's in heaven now, right? Who's next to him in her body? Mama Mary, right? And she wears, because she's a Filipina, she wears like 3,000 veils. And what is Jesus doing? He's in his glorified body. He's equal to Abba Father, isn't he? God from God, life from life, true God from true God. Now, what's he doing? He's picks them back and forth. And he goes, look at Irma. And Jesus is saying, she is such an Irma. She has Irma-ness. She has irma -ability. So right now, Jesus is interceding for us. Jesus said, I prayed for you. Now, I'm, I'll be teaching on this in Florida, but I'll, I'll give you a little snippet. Stop praying for only in a crisis. Prayer is never meant to be prayed in a crisis. Let me give you an example. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, it says God was after our first parents in the cool of the day. What do you do in the cool of the day? You pray. That's a Jewish time to pray. So what were our parents doing? When, because God was doing what? Talking to them. What you need to do, what I need to do is this. Prayer is never meant in a crisis. But what, what, what do most of us have done in the church? Pray in a crisis. You pray to commune with God in your caves. What Jesus did masterfully, when the Holy Spirit came down upon that scene in his baptism, it says in Luke 3, he prayed, then the Holy Spirit came down. So when you stop praying in your crises, God will open up the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I want to be prayed up every day because I want to be ready for what's coming during the day. And for the most part, I can give witness to our, our Lord and Savior. I am. When I don't have enough oomph in me to do that, maybe because I haven't prayed. Amen? So, everybody read their Hebrew 7. So, we, we just learned two interesting facts. Well, a lot of interesting facts already. Satan talked to him like Job. Because what does he want to say? In order for the disciples of Jesus to be true, they have to be proven through the crucible of their life. In the book of Wisdom, chapter 3, we all go to 100 funeral masses. And everybody picks Wisdom 3. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. In Wisdom 3, it says, going through the fire, the crucible. Until and Jesus sends the saying to every one of you, you want to word from God? You're going through the crucible, baby. Now, here's what I'm learning. You are where God wants you right now. You mean I didn't blow it? Was he upset when he says, oh, they're going to Middletown. I wanted them in Hazlitt. Is he upset? No, you are where God wants you. How many can rejoice? Yes, ma'am. So is that why they let Satan, God let Satan back into heaven? Yes. The crucible. Yes. Okay. You need the crucible because here's what prayer does for you. Notice Jesus says, I prayed. I prayed. Does he know how to pray? Anybody think he knows how to pray? Yes. Everybody shake your head, yes. Jesus knows how to pray. Do I know how to pray all the time? No. So what do I resort to? Hail Mary, for the grace, Lord, is with thee, blessed art thou, and the Holy Mary. Our Father, I know don't we go back to our formal prayers? Everybody should go, yes again. Is that what we should now? We gotta get into absolute communion with God. And then you'll be ready for it. You're gonna be crucibled. Amen? Then when you're crucibled, you get to go through boot camp. First Kings 17. He had the incredible power of attorney. Anything he said that God would do, God would do for him. How many would like that power? 
oh, what I do, oh, give me that power, Lord. And guess what? I have it. That's why I gotta learn how to live in the supernatural. See, you're getting all this good stuff. I just hope there's somebody out there saying, I really would like this for me. And, and don't be pompously saying, well, oh, not me. Then forget it. Get it! Yes, Dr. Phil, with those three interesting kids. <laughs> So, Father, doesn't Satan demand all of us? Yes. So, if he demands all of us, I don't try to understand the connection of him. Satan demands all of us, yes. Being permitted to get to heaven, what, what does that have to do with his demanding of to have Peter? He goes, right, he goes, because when's the last time they were battling it out? Yeah. When Jesus was tempted. Right. When's the last time that he was seen, really seen, Herod wanted to kill him? Because Satan is a murderer. Now you know Satan's sh showing up. Here's, listen, listen very carefully. You're going to miss good stuff on it. Satan shows up when your thoughts go nuts. And let me tell you, see the person next to you? Their thoughts go nuts. <laughs> Satan works on your thoughts to produce an action in you which is not with God's thinking. So when there's confusion, sorry, yes. Sorry. If you have confusion, 1 Corinthians 10, um, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 34. It's not God. Confusion is not God. But then what do we do? We start to blame him. Yes, Miss Lisa. Yes, Miss Jackie. Confusion is temptation. Confusion is your thoughts going all over the place. And that's, that's I know that's not of God. It's not of God. That's not temptation. He, God never produces in you confusion. So now let's take an average day you go through. How many get confused? Yeah. <laughs> it's called welcome to life. <laughs> Amen. So now, Jesus prays for you. How many have ever asked him in your spiritual journey to pray for you? Mm -hmm. Say you're sitting there at 2 o'clock in the morning in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Did you ask him to pray for you? Yeah. He's right there. Jesus, Anybody ever do that? You never asked Jesus to pray for you? Mm -hmm. why, why haven't we done it? Because he, we think he's what? And he is God. So I'm trying to get to you. But it's so beautiful, the Trinity, that Jesus prays for us. Are you learning anything new yet? Okay, good stuff. Next he says there, we could be on this all night, huh? And when you have turned again, uh, your faith may not fail. The worst thing that can happen for you in prayer life, ready? The worst thing is you believe that you turn from God the Father. You believe God doesn't like me, love me, you believe God went to the Cayman Islands for the weekend. <laughs> How many ever believed once in your life God wasn't there? Because you made a mistake and God's punishing you. How many ever believed that? By the way, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Please don't ever believe that. And I apologize to all of you on bend and knee. Sometimes we taught you that. And it's right now because you're over 50 years old. It's hard to convince you otherwise. Because I'm giving you good news. And it's hard in your old thinking because you'll, you'll think like that again. Get out of your stinking thinking. <laughs> so now what's Peter going to do? So what, what's, what's faith failing? Faith failing means God's not there for me. So what did Peter do when he denied Jesus three times? He had sorrow unto repentance. Judas has sorrow unto death. Now here's the difference. Peter said, God forgive me! And he's crying. God forgive me! Save me! I'm sorry! Judas says, as the noose is around his neck, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for this to happen. What have we got to do to repent? I don't want you ever to put a noose around your neck. Because right now, the Holy Spirit gave witness to me that suicides are going to increase. They're out of control right now. 
and you know what they're doing on TV and everything else? We now have new hotlines if you're thinking of suicide. And guess what happens because those two people from Parkland just committed suicide? Guess what happened? Right now, the suicide hotline has gone up 1,000%. We think about killing ourselves. Please don't anybody to go there. Amen, please? Yes. I love you. Stay around. I don't want to do your funeral just yet. I haven't thought of the words I'm going to say uh, anyway. So anyway. <laughs> when you have turned, I ran the line the word turned. When you have turned, that's the word shub, S-H-U-B. Strengthen your brethren. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, everything I go through and get through is to help you. Push the repeat button. Everything I go through and get through is to help you. That's what Jesus is saying to Peter. Peter, you denied him. Now, what are you going to think? I can't make it now. That's why God allowed him to do the worst thing, is to look at Jesus face to face in that, that garden experience and say, I swear to you, I don't know. I think that's a betrayal, don't you? Yes. That's pretty blatant and obvious. Now, what does he say there? I'm going to strengthen your brethren. And he said to them, Lord, I'm ready to go to you in prison and, and death. Well, not me. Here's what I pray. I said, that is me. I said, God, don't let it be me anymore. Because you only have, any temptation you have, you only have about 10 seconds to get out of it. That's not a lot of time. People are looking at you. And what's definitely happening, I've got to give you some more good stuff. The persecution you're going to see within a few months is going to raise dramatically in all of your lives. I mean, you think you got it now. Get your family converted now, Holy Spirit, do your job, because what you're going to see, the demons of hell, Revelation chapter 9, are breaking loose. And they're all pouring out right now. Anybody ever heard of South Florida? They have a bunch of poisonous frogs hitting Southern Florida right now. I'm going to Central Florida and then I'm going out of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And why, why are we interested in frogs? It's the plagues of Egypt are returning. Locusts are appearing all over the world, a, a, a gazillion of them. And now the frogs are out. <coughs> what do you do with a poison? And they're multiplying all over the place. Wow. Can you say, Lee, there's a Horrible. couple of frogs outside. <laughs> Amen? You might say they're cute. <laughs> and you wouldn't let your dog out to bite them or sniff them. Amen? So he says, I'm going to go to prison. Now, underline the word prison because in the Bible, the word prison is not hardly mentioned. But when you read Matthew 25, Jesus says, when I was in prison. Peter, will Peter go to prison? Yes, of course he's going to prison. Where's that in the Bible? Acts 12. So he will go. And what happened? Remember when Peter was in prison? The doors start opening up. The angel comes. And it's really kind of funny because he goes knocking on um, Rhoda's door. Remember Rhoda? You don't know who Rhoda is. You know who Rhoda is? Hello, Rhoda. It's Peter. Peter's in jail. And she, so she goes through the peephole. Peter, is that you? Rhoda, it's me. Open the door. Peter's in jail. <laughs> so she runs back into the house. Guess what? What? Peter's angel's at the door. Again. <laughs> and they're all go by the little people. Peter. It's Peter! Open the door for Peter! I'm giving you the live animated version. <laughs> and they said, Peter, what the heck are you standing out there? No, wait, open the door, open the door. <laughs> and what a name, Rhoda, Rhoda, huh? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Paul. Should I ask? 
go ahead, go ahead, ask him. Go ahead, Phil. Wait, is your name Lee, sir? <laughs> go. <laughs> she had a TV show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, in, it's in the Bible. <laughs> yes. Acts 12. Read Acts 12. Don't you know these things? <laughs> Never heard this one. <laughs> you can tell your good Catholic stateless stories. <laughs> I tell you. Is, is this good stuff you're getting? <laughs> we only did two verses. <laughs> Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison. He will. Everybody put in their axe well. And to death. He will. And he will be dying on the cross upside down. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, now notice. Look at verse 31. See Shimon, Shimon? Notice he's calls on Peter now. See the shift in names? Why the shift in names? Because when you are Peter, you are my disciple. When you're Simon, Simon, you're, you're, you're old you. So one is the old you, and one is the new you. Amen? Now which of you show up? The old you or the new you? In John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene wanted to cling to the old Jesus, and that's why Jesus says in Italian, Non toccare! Don't touch me. I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you three times deny that you know me. How many think you'd be spooked out by a cock crowing? <laughs> Did you see Rhoda in there, sister? Chapter 12? I didn't see. Verse 14. 14? Mm -hmm. Mine is verse 14. Oh, I got it. I didn't see it. All right, so maybe we all need a cock to crow. Are there any cocks in Aberdeen? <laughs> Red Bank, Father. Red Bank. One in Red Bank. You've heard a few of them in, in Red Bank. Red Bank. Yes, right by the restaurant, there's a yep. lot of cocks going down there. <laughs> I played, I played a soccer field there. So you've been cocky down there. <laughs> Amen? Very interesting. So now, see the name shift? Well, we'll probably this day. And he said to them, when I went out with you, no purse or bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Now, do you lack anything with Jesus? I'm going to make a simplistic statement. The more you have of Jesus, the less you need. So guess what? Basically in my life, I don't need anything. They said, can I get you this? I said, no. Do you want that? I said, no. Christmas comes, what do you want? I said, nothing, I have everything. Mm -hmm. What do you want for your birthday? I said, besides, I have everything. got my good looks. What else do I need? <laughs> <laughs> Amen? What else, what else do you need? I have, if I have Jesus... I have everything. Do I have amen? Amen. So amen. now Jesus is saying, now when you go out with the gospel, everything he gives you, you can give it to him back with interest. So what happened was, look at verse 35. I sent you out with no purse. And when did he send you out with no purse? Luke 10, if you put Luke 10 in there. Without bag or sandals? Did you lack anything? How many know, again, that's not living supernaturally when you're wearing, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Do you remember that? Luke 12? How many of you ever said that? Where are we going to sleep? Where are we going to eat? What are we going to do? How many of you, so what, that's why you don't do it. Because you say you can't do it. When I got assigned to Newark, I passed out and the ambulance had to resuscitate me. And I'm a white boy living in an African-American neighborhood. I'm like... I said, save me, Lord, save me. <laughs> One day I was walking down to give um, last rites, to use your term. And one African-American gentleman says, you're a white boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had garbage all over the place. I think there was a garbage strike, something interesting like that. You don't live here. I said, good sir, I live right around the corner. Why don't you visit me for church on Sunday? No way. <laughs> I said, I am privileged to, to live in your n n n neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and you, if you want to know where I am, 
across the street from the loud bar <laughs> with attack helicopters coming at night <laughs> with people saying, you blankety, blankety, blankety <laughs> with mama rats about this big oh, yeah. and their tails are nice to look at. Yes. <laughs> Mi casa es su casa. <laughs> Amen? Are you getting this? So how many think you could do, look at what they said there, verse 25. Nothing. When you're with Jesus, you lack nothing. Amen? Now, for me to help us to get into the supernatural, here's your prayer. From Ephesians 1.18, you got to pray that the mind of your eyes are enlightened. What does that mean? You only see what you see here. What's happening to everything you see here? It's passing away. Here's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for you. I want to bring you to what the Holy Spirit really can do for you. Way beyond. When you start thinking like that, then you can start to behold what's coming for you. And you live in the power of God. Are you getting this with me? He said to them, but now let him who has a purse take it. Likewise a bag. Let him who has no sword to sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled in me. It is written, reckon with the transgressors. For it is written, about me has its fulfillment. Lord, here are two swords. Now, Jesus says to us that this is the time that everything I taught you, you got to fight for it. Now, do you remember our blessed Lord tells us the parable where they will fast one day? When the Pharisees are saying, look, we're fasting, but yours aren't? What does Jesus mean? He says, their time hasn't come, but they will. When you come to the point where Jesus is taken supernaturally to the glory in heaven on the Mount of Olives called the Ascensions, 40 days after his holy resurrection, what happens now, we're going to be seemingly left alone until we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll be taking a sword up and we'll be fighting never, as Paul says in Corinthians, never, 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 never on the earthly realm because our swords are going to be so powerfully, which is the word of God, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. You've got to take up that word. You've got to know, fight in the power of the spirit. Then, as Jesus did immediately in Gethsemane, they all fell down, all 800 of them. I heard our guide say 600. He was wrong. It's 800. 800 people fell down instantly and they were slain in the spirit. They were all knocked out. Do you remember that? They were all knocked down. John 18. They were all knocked down, completely knocked down. So how many here would like to see that kind of power? It is your time to get up and fight. If you don't fight, you're going to lose. So Jesus says, remember, you lack nothing because I was with you. Now, take everything I have, the new person, the new wine. Amen? Take the, take the sword. Now, what is a sword? A sword was about this big. It was one of those little French fights. <laughs> the sword was about this big. So what do you have to do to your enemy? Be close. You have to smell his bad breath. His pimples all over his face. And his cursing mouth. When I was doing an exorcism, the devil was too close to me. <laughs> and I said, devil, you're going to the cooker. And you know what he says to me? I'm dragging you with me. <laughs> Stop in the name of love. I said, wait, wait. I said, devil, by the power of the blood of the lamb, you need to leave. And start screaming and the F word keeps flowing out. By the way, you know why I hate the F word? Because when I do those two exorcisms, it's the devil's favorite word. So when you say, when I hear that F word, I go, Ooh. I know who's, who's dancing around here. Ooh. You never heard that, right? Oh. Hit him now. Go ahead. <laughs> Amen. So what, what you got to do, I don't, when you're with me, you lack nothing. But now you're going to have the Holy Spirit with a new sword. Take up the sword. Now what's the sword? Ephesians 6. It is, circle this, it's your only defensive, uh, I'm sorry, it's your only offensive weapon. Your offense. So I walk out. Make my day. So it's the word of God. The word of God. 
the word of God. So if I hear anybody cursing, I says, we don't do that here. We shouldn't do it anywhere. So notice he says there, look, are you getting this? Is this good stuff? But now, then him who, who has a purse, take it. Right now, what's the purse? The purse is what you're going to rely on in the power of my spirit. Right now, you're going to be left. First of all, this is the scary thing. Jesus is going to Calvary to die. What's going to happen when Peter denies him? You're going to feel like you're very much alone. And what, what are you going to say? I need money. What does the money mean? Who denies him? 30 pieces of silver. It was prefigured by the first to Joseph in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. But now it says, take up the purse. Who are you going to really sell short for? What are you going to do? The worst thing to do is that you feel like you've got to fight and you're all by yourself. How many have ever been there before? And how do you know you're by yourself? Because your mind starts saying these things. What do I do now? And I don't have enough money. I should fight a little harder. Forget all those Bible studies. Love, pussy, willows, and balloons. Love, love, love. I can't do that. I'm going to fight. I'm going to knock the guy's brains out in Christian love. So you, you take back your old stuff, amen. He says, no. But I'm going to lead you in the power of the Spirit. When you take up your swords, you're going to know it's a different sword of the Word of God. Because if you take up the other sword, you're going to have a desire to go back to the old you. Because when you go back to the old you, even for a moment, have I been to the old you before? Have you, have you resurrected him or her? Yes. Do you know what I feel my job is? Do you remember years ago we would pump up the tire? The, the bike tire? So here's what I want to do. I'm going to stick a little needle in you and just go. <laughs> Okay, so if you see me doing this, it, it's the new hoot, hoot nanny dance. Okay, you got that? So I got to stick a needle in you, amen? Because I want Holy Spirit air in you. So now Jesus says, when you feel that, what's Peter going to do? What did we just hear? You're running away from me. You're going to deny me. But it's okay. Is God going to beat you up? Never. He doesn't know how to beat you up. Forgive me, forgive us. That, that you always kind of, or sort of believe that somehow along the line. Forgive us, that's not true, it's not true, and it's not true. I, for, I, I beg all of your forgiveness. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how you say of um, us feeling alone. Yes, do you ever feel alone? Be Even with that knight in shining armor next to you? <laughs> being, being alone is part of the depression. Yes. And when you are depressed, yes. you don't have the power of God when you're depressed. It's, 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 what's depression? Your thoughts. Mm -hmm. so you don't have God in your thoughts. That's why you better get mm -hmm. to this stuff I'm giving you. Mm -hmm. I gotta bring you, I, I, God's gonna bring us into the supernatural living. Mm -hmm. And it begins with your kabanza. Mm -hmm. It's a word for head, I make up my own words. Yes, sir. Father, the first, can the first be considered also the gifts of the Spirit? The what? Can the first be considered the gifts of the Spirit? Maybe in a supernatural sense, yes, but in this sense is, I'm leaving, I'm going to the cross. You're going you're gonna to have to want to run back to the way you were. There's two levels. Level number one is you're going to feel abandoned. Take up your sword and start fighting. Level number two, later on, you're going to have to fight in the kingdom of God. You see the two levels? Yes. Well, Peter didn't have the weapons of uh, the sword of the spirit until Pentecost. He got away to Pentecost. So prior to that, when he cut off the servant's ear in Gethsemane, he was using a real literal sword. He was right, holding back good. on the old man. Yes. He, and, the, 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 and Jesus touched the head and the ear appeared back on there. How many know that was an incredible miracle? Can you imagine seeing your ear flying? And then you could just see the blood gushing down and Jesus touching it and there's another ear. How many think he could hear for the rest of his life after that? His, his name is what? Malchus. <laughs> All right. And he, he was reckoned with transgressors. So who are the transgressors? Jesus is reckoned with transgressors. Now what does the word reckon mean? It's a banking term you got to give an account. Okay, everybody see that in verse number, um, verse number 35? Verse 37? 
And he was reckoned with transgressors. Now, what's a transgression? A transgression is you know what the word says and it's going to happen. Don't come into this yard. A dog will tear off your leg. And so all of a sudden, a few hours later, you only have one leg. So what happened to you? I transgressed. Because I, didn't, I read the sign correctly, but I didn't obey it. So I'm only down to one leg now. So a transgression is, uh, you ever hear the woman Avon? The word in Hebrew is hatat. H-A-T-T-A-T, hatat. Don't transgress. Don't transgress. You know what it says. And so Jesus says, you know what the scripture says about me? I'm going to be, Isaiah 53, I'm going to be with transgressors. Those who practice religion. Glory, oh, oh but they transgress the law. How many, how many know there's so much religious hypocrisy that we transgress so much? Do I hear amen? amen? Next he says to us, verse number 38, and look Lord, here are two swords. So, do you think they understood what Jesus said? No. And one of the swords is going to do what? Yeah, you're going to want your money back because you've got to understand I'm your Lord and I'm going to be crucified. And what are they going to say? Give us our money back. Because we didn't, we didn't, we don't want a crucified Lord. We want someone, like Judas says, stand up there, we'll put you on a parapet, and you've got some power, bump off the Romans. You know, if I were God, I'd definitely do things differently. I use lightning bolts a lot. <laughs> and I'd send them to most members in your family. <laughs> Amen? How many would like to use a few lightning bolts on some people? Everybody shake your head. Yes, come on, you're honest. Don't be these, don't be these pious church people. <laughs> We're real human beings and we got to kill it. <laughs> Amen? Are you getting this? Okay, Amen? Are you getting this? Now, you're getting good stuff. So Peter says, hey, 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 Lord, I got someone with two swords. Two! So I go out of the mic and say, I can't! I, 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 I. <laughs> and remember what the sword is? This small. So I gotta go up to you. Good, you know why, you know why I like small swords? It's blood and guts. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and then Jesus says, Oh, this is really good. Are you going to get stuck with the verse 39? Jesus says in the basta, not pasta, basta. <laughs> That's enough. So they totally misunderstood. So he says enough. And by the way, when's the last time he said enough? When he was on the Sea of Galilee. He says, I'm going to snooze. Peter says, we're going down. Andrew says, I doubt it. <laughs> Peter says, I left my mother-in-law for this. <laughs> the storm goes, shh, 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 we're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're not going to make it to the other side. Get him up. Get him up. How many here get upset when somebody's, you're in a crisis and the person's not in a crisis with you? And they're just sleeping on your couch with the dog sitting on your pillow. I mean, <laughs> how many think, you know, and everything but it's common, you're like, get him up! How many ever did that before? You're wild, and you're like going through a jungle, Georgia the jungle with a wild banshee in your, and everybody's, everybody's calm and you're wild. What do you want to do? Get everybody up. <laughs> and so what do they say? Let's get him up. <laughs> so Jesus gets up. This is in Mark 4. You look like I'm making this up. It's all in the Bible. <laughs> and Jesus raises his hand and he says, in Italian, Basta! He 
said, that's enough. And now what does he say? This is the second time because they're going to go through a storm of seeing the cross. And what are they going to say? Jesus says, now watch this, it really gets good. Turn to the person and say, this is really good. Yeah. It's going to say, enough. Now, how many of you have ever had a crisis before? Yeah. And you, you had a crisis before? <laughs> um, are, how many know, tell the person next to you, say, good for you, there's a few more coming. <laughs> <laughs> And so Jesus, we need Jesus to stand up and say, Basta, 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 basta. Amen, basta. Is this good? Now watch this, this is really good. Uh, the Lord really knows how to write a Bible. Amen. Now, verse 39. Boy, we're really moving fast here. And he came out and he went as, as custom to Mount Olive. Now, put in there 2 Samuel 18. He went into Mount Olives every time he was in Yerushalayim because he couldn't stand the world of religion. Can I be honest with you? Don't tell my secret. I hate the world of religion. It's going through the motions and you're not closer to God for it, amen? Not, not at all. So where was Jesus? Now watch this, you gotta get the, gotta get the vision. He's sitting on Mount Olives and when you sit on Mount Olives, what do you look at? The walls of Jerusalem. What do you look up when you look up? The temple. Mm -hmm. So what's he looking at? The walls and the temple. And guess what he's saying? Oh. What did we just hear him saying in Luke 19? Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim. How I wanted to gather you like a mother hen with her little chickadees. Amen. Are you getting this? Then he says to us, Amen, Olives, and the disciples followed him. Underline the word followed. That means they got on his coattails. That means they were very close to him. And when he came to the place where he said to them, Pray that you may not enter temptation. Now, this is the journey from the upper room crossing the Kindred Valley, and now they're stationed and they find exactly the spot where we were on Olives. Now, who was there prior days? King David. Now, I want you to pay attention when you read the Bible the next time. Jesus does something so identifying with David more than any biblical character in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because David was a gibor. G-I-B-B-O-R. A gibor means a warrior. And right now, because you and I have the Holy Spirit, we got to be warriors. Amen? I think the, the most important person in my life was my mother. i never seen a woman fight like she did. <laughs> she yells at umpires and people who give meats and, and, and I mean, she yelled at everybody. And I just hid behind her. <laughs> Even at baseball games, she yelled at Alex Rodriguez. <laughs> you know what your problem is, Alex? Mom, you're talking to Alex? <laughs> you're rich and you're no good! <laughs> Well, she got a little carried away. <laughs> so the little girl was right in front of my mother, and my mother's yelling at Alex Rodriguez, and she's popping popcorn. <laughs> and my mother intensified when he got up. Strike him out! <laughs> and the girl is just watching my mother. <laughs> she had a big popcorn like this. At Yankee Stadium, it cost $20, I'm sure, <laughs> with butter on it, $25. And she's popping the popcorn. Strike out! And he, and he struck out and she said, yes, good for you! You rich millionaire. <laughs> Saint Alex, go to heaven. Okay, now. Yeah. So where's Jesus? He's on the very spot David was. Where David got betrayed by Ahithophel. You got these words down? Ahithophel. The same betrayal happened on the same spot in the same place. Wow. Now, because David was just across the kitchen. Where was Jesus? You ready for this? Here's Jesus in Gethsemane. Straight, anybody been to Gethsemane? Straight across from Gethsemane would have been King David's palace. Do you remember being there? I was just in there and I, I just did prayer time. 
And some of you were crying and you went up to the, the rock. And remember that? And right there would have been King David's palace. And David, just right over there, got betrayed by Ahithophel. 2 Samuel 18. Then he says to him, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now watch this. This is the full explosion of the Our Father. Our Father right in heaven. What's the last line? Don't. Now, what does that mean? Does everybody know what Jesus meant by that line? In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. In Luke chapter 11, verses number 2 and 3. What does it mean? Don't lead us into temptation. God. The temptation right now. And I'm, I'm doing a, a new series on the signs of the, these days we're in. You're going to see tremendous temptation. And here's the scary thing. Most people are going to fall away. Hmm. I hope nobody here. Because you've all been told. So God, don't let me fall away. The temptations are sure to come. Luke 17. But woe to you who are led astray. So pray. Pray. That you don't be led astray. Because what, what are the three temptations? 1 John 2.15. Remember the three temptations. And if you want some prayer time for, for Lent, those are the three that you and I won't succumb to anymore. Pride. Lust of the eyes. Cool, baby. Lust of the flesh. Hey, what do you want today? Flesh? Let's go for it. Meat. A juice. Let's have cake. Blow up. Let's get drunk. Drink. Let's have a few women. Amen. That's good. First John 2.15. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed. Now, underline, he knelt down. How many ever remember Jesus kneeling down before? No. Jewish people don't kneel. Now, this is our Lord and Savior. This is the most... In now, watch this. When you pray in the Spirit, here's what you, you want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Yes. God will raise you up to the intensity of the, what you're facing to pray. How many ever just had to go away and your son follows you? And you go in front of the bus of sacrament and there you are, you're really into it. You're intensely praying. How many intensely pray? Please, please. Don't let them get hurt. Please. Heal them. Please, God. Please, God. And so what happened is your prayer starts to rise. Now watch this. We're going to find something very strange happens. This is the birth of the passion of Jesus. It begins now. At this moment, when he kneels, your sins are going on him. Every, were, they, were they on him before? No. They're on Jesus at this moment. Are you getting this? Every, now I hate to tell us this. Even the ones you'd commit tomorrow, next week, next year, or the next 10 years. Every one of them is going on him. So what does he do? The weight starts coming on him. The weight starts coming. How many know one of your sins is very weighty? And then he has to what? Fall to his knees. Now, what does Jesus do? He rises up in the level of prayer called intensity. Let me explain it to you this way. Is this making sense to you? When you pray, there are three levels of prayer. Ask. Could you do this? Seek. Where is it? Where are my keys? Where's my pocketbook? Where's my wallet? I have credit cards in there. Has everybody done that at least once? And then you go to the most intense knock, you pound, you pound, you pound. What level are you in prayer? What's it all about? Are you looking yet? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. And, and, and Luke's gospel is called Seek ye first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the, seek the kingdom of heaven. A little deeper, isn't it, in Luke? So where are you in your prayer? A-S-K. Which level are you on now? 
Jesus came to the ultimate crush. What does Gethsemane mean? I'm crushed. Because a Gethsemane was a boulder that you would crush the grapes down and then you would see a little funnel flowing out and all the, all the, all the juice of the olives would be coming out. It was pure olive oil. And so what does Jesus have to do? He has to be crushed so every drop of his blood comes out when one of our sins was placed on him. And that's called when he starts falling down. Now watch this. You getting good stuff? When he starts falling down, this is called Jesus getting gethsemane Now what happens when you get Gethsemane? What happens if I take a, an olive green or black? You can have them both, I can't stand them. <laughs> I think that's the worst thing God ever created are those things. <laughs> Even if it's stuck in a martini somewhere or whatever, or Manhattan, whatever you're drinking these days. When it's crushed, it explodes, right? And so when Jesus comes, he has to do what? Fall on your knees. Now watch this, this is really good. What is another time somebody in the Bible knelt down prior to this? After this, it was St. Paul in Ephesians 3, 14. Jews don't kneel down. There was one man called Solomon. When God gave him, in 1 Kings 3, he falls down on his knees. Shalomo. What's his original name? Jedediah. And what does he do? He falls on his knees and he does this. Read it in 1 Kings 3. And so now Jesus has to fall all the way down. Can you see him going to his knees? Now, did, when, you went, when you saw the rock in Gethsemane, did you cry a little bit? And you saw the iron, iron crown of thorns? By the way, the crown of thorns was so piercing, it went right into his skull. It wasn't just laid on the top. They weren't doing nice. Yes, sir. I was going to say, in, when Paul's talking about one of the letters about being poured out like a libation, was that yes, similar, that's Philippians. To, similar to what you're describing here, the way? Yes, you've got to be poured out. I, everybody, this is interesting that Jesus kneels, isn't it? Did you ever see that before? Yes. Moses fell flat on his face, prostrate, in Exodus 3. He had to go all the way down, take his sandals off, you're on holy ground. So that he did a prostration, but he didn't do a kneeling. Miss Lisa. So I read somewhere recently that um, the pain that he suffered. The pain that Jesus suffered. In Gethsemane. In Gethsemane. Was worse. Was worse. Than dying on the cross. Than dying on the cross, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Why? Because all of the sins. All of the sins was on him. For all mankind. Now, isn't it amazing that all the way up to that blood, time there was right? no sin on him? Blood. Second, Paul says in Second Corinthians five, Jesus became sin for us. That's when it happened. So that's what did he have to do? He had to kneel down. And so when he's going to his passion, his passion starts. Everybody, right in there. The passion starts. When he's going to his passion, not only is he spiritually being drained, emotionally being drained, now he has to physically experience it too. And this is called the Greek word kenosis. We read about that with St. Maximus tonight. This is called the, the outpouring, amen? It makes you think this is a good lesson for today, isn't it? Yes. Pray that you, and withdrew from about a stone's throw, verse number 40, Father! Now remember I told you something. When you have the intensity of prayer, you believe that God the Father left you. Push the button. When you have the intensity of prayer to meet the occasion you're in, there is a struggle for you not to believe or to, to believe that the Father left you. Mm -hmm. Because it's so bad out there. Forsake. And then you forsake, yeah. Uh, Psalm 22, verse 1. So what's the first word of Jesus in prayer? Father. Do you get it? We're, getting, we're, we're going into the deepest prayer life of Jesus you can ever imagine. Now this is the full exposure 
of the soul inside Jesus. Some of you love Padre Pio. Here's what exposed to him too. Whoa. <coughs> so when, you, when the occasion rises and you're in, you're in straight, say you have two parents that are driving you, that causes you to pray a little extra. Now it gets a little more intense. So what's your first word? Don't leave me now, God. Father! How did Jesus say that? Abba! I had one of the most freeing moments in my life when I go to my room crying. People don't think I cry. I cry all the time. When I look at you, I cry. <laughs> You all cause me to cry when I hear your stories. I go. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, right there, Appa. Now, watch this. Are you getting good stuff? This is where Jesus teaches you what Abba means. You can't learn Abba until you go through this. Amen. I'll give you more Abba. Abbas. Galatians 4 4, Romans 8 15. Galatians 4 4, Romans 8 15. Oh, our time is almost done here. Father, if you are willing, remove this chalice from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is wrestling in his flesh and he says, Take the chalice. That's why I said, The cup, notice it's a chalice. Um, the suffering servant song in Isaiah 50 says, raise the cup. And what's the cup? It means two things. He's going to give us the cup of blessing, but he's going to take the cup of the chalice of suffering. And notice what Jesus said. Now, are you getting this? I'm not going to drink this with you until you arrive in heaven. Do you remember that? We just heard that. And what is Jesus now? Do you understand what he means by it? I'm taking this and I'm, this is the cup. This is the fourth cup. I'm going to be poured out for you on the cross and I can't drink it. That's why when they offer him ambisol, vinegar, he doesn't take a drink. And they try to take a little sponge on that little stick and put it to his, and he says, I can't because I'm being poured out. And I don't want my blood being poured out with a little bit of your ambisol. Because I love, I love you so much, you people out there, that I'm going to give it all this kenosis. And so you got to see the fourth cup, and I'm almost done with the fourth cup. And so guess what, Father? And that's why I went in, in Matthew 20 with those two lung kids and the mothers. Lord, make, they're good boys. Make one a governor of Jerusalem. Make one the mayor. And he says, Lady, do you know what you're asking? Sure. Do you, want to, do you want the cup? Of course, my boys are such good boys. Then they're going to suffer like I do, and they will. And you know, he's talking to the mother of James. And what were they looking at? Jerusalem, Matthew 20. Isn't it interesting? Where did the two Jameses die? Jerusalem. Who got his head chopped off? James, number one, James the Great. Where was it? Jerusalem. James number two, who we saw, we just saw, but somebody was, didn't see it. I saw James the less, and he was in the ground. And all the seminarians were pouring in, and what did they do before they start their morning prayer? In a language, I have no idea what they said. I believe they were praising God. And they would go in, wearing their black, and they would kiss the ground where James the less was. What did they do to him? In the year 62 AD, they threw him off the top of the temple. Wow. And when, they, when he came down crashing, he was still alive a little bit. So they took clubs and they beat him until there was no more life oh. in him. So that's James the Less. So the, remember Mama? <laughs> Mama? Let me tell you something, Mama. Let's follow the rest of the story. The rest of the story is both those Jameses died right across the way. Now they took the cup. Do you understand what the cup is? It's blessing for all of us, the redeemed. It's suffering with Jesus. So you dare go to Holy Communion. Did you go to Holy Communion, ma'am, today? You took the cup of suffering so you could be blessed. Whoa. 
Whoa, is this good stuff or what? So he says to us, Abba! This is really good. <coughs> Everybody put a star by verse 42. Remove this chalice from me. Really, I don't want to take this drink. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Put in there the completion of the Our Father. Your will be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Now here comes an angel. An angel. Notice Eileen says an angel. When it usually says the angel, it's the incarnate Jesus appearing in another form. He says an angel. Now here's a shock to you. Jesus had a guardian angel too. Did you know that? He had a guardian angel. So right where he was, all these angels were following him. Because where were they in heaven? They're worshiping him. And now they pop down here. The master. He looks different. He's one of them. And they're lower than us. And so the angel came, put in there Jesus' guardian angel. Is this good? This, this, this is incredible, isn't it? And, and what happens there, so underline there, verse 43, the angels come to strengthen him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Now, underline that. What happens when you pray? You've got to turn the juices up. That's what I mean. The intensity of the hour. We do not have a church that prays in the intensity of the hour. If I were a bishop of a diocese, without those names of those priests just coming out, I would say in my diocese, shut down everybody, we're going into intensity of prayer. We are being maligned, we are being brought down. I would say, every parish, holy hours, every parish, call for fasting. Amen? Amen. Parishioners, listen to me, sign up right now. Open the churches night and day. Get on your face before God for what we have done. We have acted... Daniel 9, we have acted shamefacedly. And then Gabriel comes in the picture at the end of Daniel 9. Do you know Gabriel makes an appearance as soon as that happens? And so now, where are all the angels in the church? Oh, they're still there. And I believe God wants you supernaturally to know they're there. Yes, ma'am. As Catholics, except for the Mass, we are isolated in our prayer lives. We really are. You're isolated in? In our prayer lives. Yes. With the church. The Pentecostals aren't. And there's, there are other Christian We're changing that are things, not. sister. Well, we're, we're getting we're free. Amen. Amen. Do you see this? Is this amazing? Whoa, you know all this good stuff was in there. We didn't get very far tonight, but we got very far. Amen. We're, we're about done here. And this is where I want to stop. And he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became the great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now, I'm praying that you're, you, you get into blood. But what happens, this happens medically. On the top here, you have all these little interesting things going on. I don't mean your brains. Your, hopefully your brains are in there somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and all the capillaries begin to break. Wow. Hmm. So Luke being Luke the doctor, he describes that Jesus on his knees, calling out to Abba, all of a sudden, his hate, his face becomes filled with blood. Why? Why was he scared, so to speak? Why was Jesus' soul? Because, here's why. Yeah, he's going to be crucified. And we can't even imagine what he went through. Can't imagine. Because he began for the first time to know sin. Everybody in the Bible, he says, your sins are forgiven. Mark 2. He was applying this to them. But now, ready for this? The experience has begun. God will never know you, or you will never know you, until the experience of knowing God happens to you. I'm giving you all good stuff about praying. But uh, no, I don't think ever your capillaries will break on the top of your head. But I believe you're going to have intense moments. And you're going to need this. This is, going to, this is a life-saving word for you. And God's going to rescue you. 
because of Gethsemane. So, what a word, huh? Now, everybody write in there, the passion has begun. Do you see the blood now? Now, what happens was this. Remember, Gethsemane means being what? Crushed. Squeezed. And so what happened right now? Every human sin was squeezed. That's scary. And you know what? It's easier to say, your sins definitely did that. But Bill, Bill, your sins did it too. Ooh. My sins squeezed. Look what I did to my Savior. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there with him in Gethsemane? Because the Gethsemane was his now. This is Jesus literally getting Gethsemane. The olive and squished the pure juice is now coming out. I wonder what happened to that blood on his head. And then walks in Judas. And here we go. Are you, are you getting all this? And where is he looking at? Straight across the Kidron Valley. What was happening in the Kidron Valley at that very moment? There was 250 thousand lambs that were killed. Mm -hmm. Who told us that? Josephus. And where did they put all the blood of the lambs flowing out of into Kidron Valley? And so when Jesus walked, what was he walking to Gethsemane? They were singing Mark 14. Was he a baritone or a soprano? What do you think? Alto. So Jesus now looks out and he's squeezed. And here it comes on his knees to be continued. We're going to go into your soul next week, part one and part two. We, we got this great, you get your stuff? Father, we just ask your choices, blessings upon the saints as we approach Holy Week 2019. And get us ready, and thank you that we can understand a little bit better what happened in that garden. And Father, I admit in front of all these people, I have betrayed you. So many times, I can't even count. But thanks be to God, after confessing my sins to you, you wiped away every one. I thank you for that grace. Jesus, save me. Jesus, have mercy on us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. To be continued.